This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. The answer is yes. <laughs> it is Think Tech Hawaii, and community does matter here. It's very important to us. We want to take it to new levels, both in terms of engagement and in terms of education and in terms of thinking together. So I'm Jay Fidel, this is ThinkTech, and more specifically, this is Likeable Science, and I'm your guest host here on Likeable Science, and our host guest <laughs> is, is Ethan. Right over there, there's Ethan. Say hi, Ethan. Hi, Jay, how you doing? <laughs> we have a very interesting show, we're calling this The New Dichotomy, uh, plus Placebo versus Nocebo. And you will see how this is a kind of mind expander, literally mind expander, to try to figure out the human brain and human experience. So, okay, what is, what is a placebo first? And then we get to, from that to a nocebo, okay? Right. right, so a placebo is typically some inactive compound, some compound that has no biological activity that uh, is given to a patient, and the patient is told that it will have some effect on his symptoms or her symptoms. And this actually works quite well. Uh, if the patient actually believes that, that this compound they're taking, whether it's a cream they rub on them or a pill they take or a shot they receive, if they believe this is going to have a good effect, it typically will actually have a good effect. It will treat pain, it will you know, reduce inflammation, it will cure rashes, wh whatever it may be. Uh, it's, it's a remarkably robust, strong effect. It's been well understood for years that this happens, you know. But you know, I thought, now maybe I'm thinking of a different kind of um, experience there, a scenario, that you give some, you have a test, you have 10 people, you give uh, half of them a real drug, and you give the other half the placebo drug, because you want to see if the real drug really does anything, and uh, the placebo, you know it's not going to do anything. But this is another way of looking at that, isn't it? This, this, this when you describe it that way, the placebo is doing something, but it's mental. This is, this is a show about mental, you see what I mean. <laughs> uh, so how does that differ from my recollection of the classical model that you want to find out what the real drug is doing and you know the placebo is not going to do anything? Right, so, uh, and what you describe is the classic, yes, it's some sort of a balanced design where you have subjects taking a, a known inactive compound and versus an active compound to see does this really, does this medicine really work? One issue in that is do the Parties involved know what they're taking, and the parties are, are, are to. The parties are not just the patients, but it's also the doctors. Right? Ah, and okay. so the well, doctors are not necessarily relevant to this, right? Oh, they are. They're there to make conclusions after the fact, but when they do the administering of the placebo versus the real drug, you don't even need a doctor in the room. It's a it's a tech, isn't it? Well, it, you see, it depends. If the patients are given precisely the same directions on how to, how to take the drug, what to expect from the drug, then everything should be good, right? If, if, but if the doctor knows actually he's giving this guy a sugar pill and this guy uh, a potent drug, the doctor may well tell the patient slightly different things. He may communicate it in one way or another. Too right? much information. Right, exactly. Uh, it turns out when you so-called double-blind studies, where neither the patient nor the doctors know what, what's getting, you tend to get much more robust effects. I mean, you're, you're very, you're really teasing apart the real impacts of, of the, the substance then. Okay, so in, for this discussion, in this analysis, for our little show today, mm -hmm. where we examine the dichotomy between placebo and nocebo, we'll treat, we'll treat the scenario as you have suggested. It's the doctor doesn't know, mm -hmm. uh, the patient doesn't know, nobody knows, but half of this group is going to get a real drug and they have to get and, and actually you have a positive effect. Right. And it's all mental, right? Somehow. Well, physiologically mental, mental, mentally physiological. <laughs> There's something happening. Well, you see, again, I mean, it depends on how you set that up, that initial thing. So do you set up, say, telling all 10 of those patients that they're getting the drug? Or do you say, look, we're running a test. Some of you are getting this drug and some of you aren't. And you, know, you see, that makes a difference. Again, yeah, the patient's sure. expectations. Right. So it's all about expectations. And so, yes, if, if you tell the 10 patients the same thing, they're all getting this drug, your five placebo patients are likely, some of them are likely to experience a very good effect from their placebo. You Suppose know? you tell them some of you are going to have an effect and others will not. How does that change it? Well, then, then everyone's got sort of the same, well, maybe I'm in the placebo group, maybe I'm in the treatment group. 
you know. So it's not as persuasive. It's not. They, they don't take the suggestion to the same degree. Right. There, there is to some extent we we place higher value on on, on a sort of a, yeah. a known belief. So so you're likely to have some people say, oh yeah, I felt that. Right. And other people say, no, I didn't feel that, uh, because they. Whoops. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Okay. So yeah. So uh, now let's go for a moment. Let's let's dance over to the other side of this dichotomy, mm -hmm. the nocebo. Mm -hmm. Until today, actually, Ethan, I never heard the term before. Uh, what in the world is a nocebo? N O C E B O. What is a nocebo? So a, a nocebo is basically the same thing as a, as a placebo effect, but it's sort of the unintended side effect. So it is most drugs that you take, treatments that you go through, have potential bad side effects. Indeed, nowadays, if you see any of the ads on television for any compounds, they spend 20 minutes spewing out this long list of, of yeah. potential bad effects it's from blindness to death to huge waste of right. time. Huge. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that, that those uh, potential side effects, if patients are alerted to them, will show up in exactly the same sort of way. Uh -huh. So in the study that was reported on in, in, the, in the recent journal, uh, recent issue of Science. Science is a very important magazine. It's a journal. Right. It's famous. If yeah. you get published in Science, your career is assured. <laughs> uh, everybody in the scientific world knows about science. Right. And Ethan reads Science and reads the magazine. <laughs> So they, uh, these experimenters wanted to look at, look at this impact. So they took patients who were suffering from a little bit of a rash, and they gave them one of two creams. Now, both creams were actually totally inert. They have no active ingredients at all. They packaged one of them in a very fancy, high-tone, expensive-looking box, basically. <laughs> the kind you'd see in a television ad. Right, right. And packaged one of them in a rather plain, generic box, yeah. right? and uh, sort of presented these to the uh, patients as uh, a generic cream versus you know, the, the brand name, the new hot brand name cream. Yeah. And they told the patients at the same time, in exactly the same language, there was a potential side effect. Well, this was gonna cure their rash, they thought. The patients might experience a hypersensitivity, a hyperalgesia, so a, a, a pain, potential light stimuli become painful. Yeah. And interestingly enough, the patients who got the high priced medicine, the expensive medicine, yeah. experienced much more pain, much more strongly than did the patients who got the cheap medicine. Yeah. Now this, this is so you have ten people. You, right. you give them all the high priced container the labeling, and, and another ten people you give them all the low priced, right. and this is the result you get. Right. Why? How did what's the right. logic on and, that? Well, what was fascinating about this was it shows up in, in their brain activation. They, they actually looked at the. the pain centers and the, the centers in the brain that are, that are activated during painful stimuli, and they found that indeed these people were, and they were feeling this pain, you know, they, 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 it wasn't just they thought they were feeling the pain, they were feeling the pain, you know, it was, it was in their spinal cords, it was in their fr frontal parts of their brains, uh, you know, it was very striking because of the, sort of they placed a greater value on that medicine, right, they understood it was more valuable, they had a, sort of higher expectations for it, right, and therefore, so, sort of the, the what, I, what I get lost is they, they, yes, they have higher expectations, um, but the expectations are of pain. It's a well, painful well, expectation. Well, the expectations carried over to the side effects. Yeah. The, the doctor gave them exactly the same spiel about each each medication. Was there any examination of whether the medication worked? Oh uh, no, these were just, just, just the side effects. It was totally the medication was totally inert. Uh, yeah, yeah. But there was no expectation that it would work. Oh, yeah, oh yes, the patients believed it was oh, it was working, but right. they had side effects. Right, yes. So right. the expectations of working and of having side, side effects, effects were elevated right. with the fancy brand. Right, exactly. Yeah. It was very intriguing. And I mean it, people they found in larger studies this this same kind of effect where a group of people are going through uh, a treatment and if you tell the people that you are stopping their treatment, even while you continue to give them the drugs, but you tell them that, that you've stopped giving them the drugs, they all begin to experience more pain or uh, symptoms. It's a recurrence of the old symptoms. Right, exactly. Even while they're... And, and, and for that matter, recurrence of the old disease, I right, suppose. Right, right. And vice versa, of course. If, if you, you know, I mean, the classic placebo effect, if you, if you tell them they're getting treated, they will, and they believe you. So where does this take us? I mean, it, it, as we discussed before the show, I mean, it sounds like it takes us to the psychology of doctors dealing with patients and what they say to a patient while they're administering a drug. Mm -hmm. That's that's what the lesson is. Can you explain? Well, I think it goes actually deeper than that. It, it really goes to uh, the power of our belief systems, our expectations, and 
you know, if, if you believe that you have, that, that you can essentially control things in your body, yeah, you, you are able to, you know, so you can reduce your own pain level by having uh, an appropriate sort of expectation that you can do this. Uh, and and it's, it really speaks to the, the power of the mind in terms of uh, producing or alleviating symptoms in the body. Yeah, I told you this was going to be a show about mental, <laughs> and it is. And, and it calls back to me something that was popular in the 70s maybe called biofeedback. Mm -hmm. And there were doctors here in this community that would wire you up mm -hmm. and they would let you see your own, your own biological you know, light, vital signs. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was supposed to help you uh, sort of deal with yourself and know exactly where you are. You would be in touch with your physiology, and that would help you in some way. Right. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot flows out of that because I, there, I think there was some real truth in that. Absolutely. And I think most of us are sort of not self-aware of how our body is doing. Very much. Uh, we, you know, in a, in a nuclear society, uh, everything is, um, you know, detached. The brain is detached from the body. You don't think much about your body. You don't think of what terrible things food is gonna do for your body. Um, you know, you know, you're not integrated. Right, and I mean, even my recent guest, uh, R.B. Kelly has come on, and, and we talked about this with just how you present yourself, how you stand, how you posture yourself. These things you're typically not very aware of, but, but they're sending signals back and forth all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, it, it was worthy, I don't think they do it anymore, but it was a worthy the uh, adventure to do biofeedback on yourself and develop uh, that kind of awareness. And you don't actually need machinery to do biofeedback. You can just get up in the morning and say, I think I'll be in touch with myself. It's like weighing yourself on a scale. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, then you know the you know the sea changes. You know how your body is doing, at least mm -hmm. in that one measurement. Right. So, so um, can you step on like an imaginary scale and weigh yourself? And well, yeah. That you've lost weight? See, how do I feel? <laughs> How's my body really doing? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, that, and that conceivably right. uh, deals with disease and deals with pain. The other thing, just before we get into the, the, really, the meat of that, um, this strikes me that we now have technology that measures pain at the brain level. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very interesting. It reminds me of uh, Linda Wong, I think, Renee. She has a, right now today a big uh, laboratory in the basement of Queens Hospital uh, with these MRI machines, very advanced, very advanced MRI machines where she can analyze the brain and what's going on in the brain, how the brain is developing. And I don't know if she's gone this far, but you know, uh, how the brain is reacting to disease, for example, right. but also how the brain is feeling, how you're feeling, right. your emotional state of mind. And you can see that objectively uh, you know, with some of these machines. So that's, that's happening now. Yeah, that's, that's why, what I was making the point earlier. The, these patients who had this expensive cream and were feeling the side effect, their brains were showing every exactly the same patterns as people who really were, who really experienced that, that hyperalgesia, the, the, the excessive pain yeah. of the light stimuli. Yeah, and in uh, some ways there's no difference right. between the reality and the perception. Right, right. But to, to get to your point about the biofeedback, yeah, biofeedback is great, right? If, if you become more aware of your, your sort of rhythms, whether, whether it's brain waves or stomach growling or whatever it may be, right? Uh, that, that's useful stuff to begin to know. But how far can that go? And, and years ago, uh, Lewis Thomas, I don't know whether you would recall Lewis Thomas, he was a, an MD who wrote a wonderful book called Lives of a Cell, talked about pe this exact topic and about people wanting to sort of get in touch with themselves. And, and he sort of took it to the logical extreme and said, but if I were told tomorrow that I was in charge of my liver, I'd be horrified. He said, I, I don't have the first clue about how to make a hepatic decision, right? Yeah. And, and it's, it's right, you know, my liver works fine, you know, it does, does what it needs to do, it yeah. filters out toxins, it, you know, yeah. does all that great stuff, and you know, I don't, I don't tell it what to do, yeah. I'm not in charge of it, right? Yeah. So where, where, where is this? So where, where I don't know, yeah. but I think in the biofeedback you actually found that you could control some things mm -hmm. uh, by simply knowing what the metrics were, where you, if you listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the big part of this, and we're going to hear about it uh, after the break, is what has all of this got to do with Donald J. Trump? <laughs> okay, now that's a cliffhanger, isn't it? It does. There's a lot to do. I'm going to come right back. We're going to tell you the answer to that question here on Likeable Science uh, with Ethan Allen and me. You'll see. Just stick around. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. Trouble 
What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DD. Captain of our team. It's a DD. For every game day, assign a designated driver. My friend, mother, what big eyes you have, she said. All the better to see you with, my dear. That's so wolf. What are you doing? Okay, pause. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, yeah uh, this is the starting line. Push. Uh, is over. You're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Okay, likable science, Ethan Allen and me. I'm the guest host. He's the host guest. Got that? Write it down. Yeah. Okay, so, so we're talking about uh, the dichotomy between placebos and nocebos, and we have found that you can do amazing things by suggesting things and developing expectations in the patient or person. Okay, and this is like a little window on the fantastic magic of the mind. Remember, and I, you write this down too, we're all mammals. We're all mammals. We're biochemical mammals. And so our minds are not like AI computers. Our minds are mammalian minds. Okay, and they can be manipulated. They can be engineered. And we run in so many ways on expectations. Mm -hmm. And we have to study that because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's likable science. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not likable, it's <laughs> something else. Okay, so the question, and we have not discussed this. This is a brand new cliffhanger for Ethan. What has this all got to do with Donald J. Trump? Well, th there is uh, Trump and, for that matter, almost any politician uh, is managing expectations. Uh, on a large scale, but it's, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, do the people at large expect that the country is going in the right direction or getting better or what, whatever it may be? And if they do, you've managed expectations well. You, you, whether you actually improve the economy or just given people the impression that the economy is improving, you know, whether their lives are actually measurably materially getting better or whether they just think their lives are getting better, does it really matter? In larger oh, it's human thing, it be the same thing right, in yeah. the mammalian, mammalian <laughs> biochemical people right. that we are. Um, but you know, I want to tell you my own experience. Okay? Okay, my sure. experience is um, back when I, I, I thought psychology, you know, was was important, uh, and uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, early on that people are mammals. I that was my theory a long time, and it's true, uh -huh. true theory. <clears throat> but uh, and, and I studied, for example, social engineering in a hacking context. Uh, like we had a lot of shows back in HPR day on the radio with these hacker people, uh, you know, who would manage to get inside your company or inside your house or inside your machine by social engineering. It wasn't even technological. It was just so it would fool you. They would deceive you. They would play on your your emotions and expectations, and they would get into your computer and they would hack it and you and everything. And uh, so, I, okay, I, I studied that. I was sort of a student of social engineering, mm -hmm. thinking that took things further than psychology. It was like applied psychology. Mm -hmm. It was a way to manipulate somebody. Sure. And it was, you know, it was a euphemism. Social, what are you talking about? Engineering, not engineering, it's psychology. Mm -hmm. But that's what people do. And I thought, gee, you know, actually, we all do that. We do that in the course of our life. You're a lawyer, go to court, you're engineering the judge to think your way, mm -hmm. or the jury. So, it's, you know, it's all about psychology. But then I, then I learned something else, Ethan, and this is only recently. And it sort of flows out of Huey Long in Louisiana about being a demagogue, or Hitler in Germany being a demagogue, and trying to fool not just the guy with the computer, you know, you want to you wanna, uh, hack his computer. No, you want to you fool the whole country. You want to fool everybody. You want to do social engineering on the grandest possible scale. Well, look at Madison Avenue. What do you think they do, okay? Right. And we have taken that to a science. And then politics, look at politics. We've taken that to a, they pay a lot of money to all these you know, consultants who work for political campaigns to do social engineering on a large population of hundreds of millions of people. It's what it is, it's social engineering. The mind, the human mind is the most incredible thing. 
we have only begun, you know, to understand it. Yeah. And I mean, just a little, and there's so much more to understand. Right. So this, this, I mean, this silly dichotomy that you've stumbled on in the science magazine, mm -hmm. well, placebos versus nocebos, is like a window into social engineering, is to managing expectations, mm -hmm. creating false reactions which people are convinced are true. Right. Right. They believe it's so true, they believe their body is actually different, right. acting differently, experiencing different sensations, diseases even. I mean, you might even solve epidemics. Right. Not just one person, but you, you know, you could change history right. by social engineering large numbers of people to manage their expectations using psychology on a mass scale. How different is that from an anthill? Well, the, the anthill is, is more uh, communal. <laughs> <laughs> the ants are more friendly. <laughs> <laughs> but the ants in general are, you know, in tune with one another on a much better level. So what are we getting here from, from Trump and expectations and social engineering and managing and having people believe what isn't true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that to me is the, uh, one of the really sort of uh, amazing and sort of disturbing aspects to our current political situation is that there appear to be a large number of people who are perfectly willing to ignore facts that are staring them in the face, and uh, situations that are just blatantly obvious, and to believe something different. But just because somebody's sort of telling them, you should believe something different. Uh, that is, I, I had some time a while ago said that I thought that Trump's election was a, a, a huge statement about the failure of our, our education system. We, hadn't, we have not taught our students, our population, to think in an evidence-based way, you know. People just, you know, if you repeat something often enough, people will start to believe it, you yeah. know, whether there's any evidence for it or not. Yeah. And this is what, yeah, he, he apparently hit on a few good themes that resonated well enough with people and hammered them home hard enough people believe these and, you know, pretty soon everyone's singing that same song. And here we are. It's well, I, I uh, you know, I think it's science what he's doing. You know, you can say he's... Uh, He's mad, mm -hmm. but there's a method about that, yeah. and I think he understands what this discussion is all about. He mm -hmm. understands nocebos. Mm -hmm. He understands how to make fe people feel that <clears throat> a subjective thing is the reality, right. and and to create the subjective thing in somebody based on maybe base impulses yeah. um, and and um, you know all the wrong things. Right. But nevertheless, it's not just one person. He's not just convincing no. a judge or a jury, right. he's convincing hundreds of millions of people. It's no. quite amazing. No. But it, it opens the door to a huge new area of science. What, you know, this is, it's not the first time it's happened, mm -hmm. but it's never happened on this scale, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 we, we need to study this. We need to study exactly what this article is about. Mm -hmm. We need to study what nocebos are mm -hmm. and expectations and psychology and the whole confluence of all these things that are purely human, uh, which we don't really fully understand because you know, it's one thing if you check me out in a clinical way, mm -hmm. put me there with the biofeed machine and all that. It's another thing if you give me the whole country to play with. It's right. a laboratory that we have not wrapped our arms around yet. Right. And we have to look at that. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, uh, this, this takes us all to a different different level, is sort of what we're doing on a planetary level. We are, we are starting to do the same kind of experimentation on our planet in terms of we're, we're dumping soot and carbon and smoke in, into the atmosphere and microplastic particulates into the ocean and we're doing this on a grand scale right. now. We're, we're and we're telling people oh, that it's good for them. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Tell, uh, talking right. about deceptions and oh, yeah. uh, switching the reality. Right. So uh, uh, Trump, uh, just uh, his EPA, just walked back a number of regulations claiming that this is sort of, this is going to be good for the country. You know, it'll, it'll make businesses proceed faster and smoother. And the fact that, you know, it's going to degrade our water systems, you know, I'll ignore all that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're... Um, we're really in trouble here um, because I think that uh, it's like it's like the net. It's like the internet. Mm -hmm. When in, when the internet it was in about the year two thousand or so, when the internet came about, uh, there were people who used it for political purposes, and they were ahead of the people who didn't use it for political purposes. And and that yin yang has continued till now. 
uh, where if you were ahead of the other guy in terms of using the science, you could affect more thinking in more people than the other guy and win that way. Mm -hmm. um, this is not necessarily making the right decision. It jeopardizes democracy. Right. Democracy assumes that we are maybe less mammalian and more rational. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now I, mean, I think it's clear that democracy is at risk because of you know, the internet, because of this kind of mm -hmm. new social psychology that right. we see uh, in evidence now more and more. Yeah. Um, and so how can we return to the place we were before uh, where we are not so affected, where our expectations were more influenced by critical thinking and evidence-based thinking, as you said? Um, how can we return to that old place? I, I suppose the better question is, can we return to that old yeah, place? Yeah, yeah. Will, will we be able to get there before we rip ourselves apart? Yeah. Well, one way, I suppose, is to study this. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. You've got to look it in the eye and sort of say, hey, this is the situation. You know, let's, let's study it. Let's deal with it. Let's learn about it. Um, and so what it, would you do if, if you knew more about it? If you knew how it worked, what would you do? Would you do a drug? <laughs> would you do a medicine? Would you do an uh, education campaign? I what think, yeah, I, I think education, I, I think uh, we, we have to ultimately come to understand that, that really every freaking one of us, all seven plus billion of us, live on one tiny little blip in the universe. And this tiny little blip has just limited resources. On, it's limited, it's got its own little supply of air, it's got its own little supply of water, neither of those is infinite. Uh, you know, what, what I do to the water around me, pretty soon is going to drift over to you. What the guy on the other side of the world does to the air, pretty soon sw swirls over to me. Uh, you know, we can't, we can't all pretend that we live in our own world and it's just us. I mean, again, this is sort of the Trump nationalism, you know, we're the only one who counts. What's good for the USA is good for all of us. End of discussion. It's no, it isn't. I mean, we're, we're all part of this global community and we need to appreciate our humanness, um, and our oneness, our relation to everyone else and to the, the planet that we live on uh, and all the rest of the life that supports us and uh, environments. That well, let me, let me uh, offer a, another thought about science okay. that has appeared also in the MIT, um, you know, science uh, uh, one, yeah. Yeah, bulletin that comes out right. every day. It's really, really yeah. terrific. Yeah. If you want to yeah. learn about what's going on in the world of science, what is it called? The MIT Download. Download. Yeah, yeah it's fabulous. You put me on with it. It's great. And one of the, one of the threads that's come out uh, recently and continuingly is about artificial intelligence, right. about AI, about how the big computer companies are mm -hmm. scrambling to get a corner on artificial intelligence. They're going to build it into our phones, mm -hmm. our computers, our world. And you know, it's a and it's part part of this is the autonomous vehicle mm -hmm. and the self-driving cars, but it's right. it's much bigger than oh, that. Absolutely, yeah. Because because it can think better than may I say better than human beings right. can think. Oh yeah. And we live in a time, you know. I hope it's uh, uh, hope it works out um, where artificial intelligence will be increasingly important to our quality of life and yeah. our and our governments. And I've always felt, and I feel more strongly now, that ultimately the human mammalian mind. With all its foibles, remember the Locke Hobbes dichotomy? Is, is mankind, if humankind, per, uh, perfectible or imperfectible? Well, you know, in some ways it's not perfectible. Sorry, we're mm -hmm. still mammals. And so, how do you solve this? I'll give you one element, one thread you can respond to me is what about uh, putting the AI machines in charge? They're rational. And, you know, they don't have problems being deceived and defrauded, I don't think. They're going to be well-programmed, of course. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but maybe, just maybe, yeah. they would do a better job and a kinder, nicer, nicer gentler job. What do you think? They, they, they might. I mean, again, it depends, because if the data is fed into them has biases within it, they will sort of incorporate, embody those, those same biases and feed them right back out. So, yes, as long as they are... Uh, appropriately programmed and, and sort of understand the, the equality, unity of, of all people, I'm all for okay. it. You know? Remember that they <laughs> teach themselves, right. and, and you can teach them to be ethical too, I believe. Right. So we live in a time when, when maybe we can clear this up before we, we find out what's, what's on the dark side, what's under the rock here uh, with all this um, you know, uh, demagoguery. Yeah, well, uh, so nice to talk to you, Ethan, it's as great, always. It's great fun. We're discovering the universe together. Thank you so much. Great fun. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>